Okay. Good morning, everyone. My name is Joseph Terigian. I'm an assistant professor at the School of International Service at American University. Uh, this year, I am running the Political Violence and Security Cluster. And today's event is uh, a co-production of PVS and the Comparative and Regional Studies Program. I'll begin by introducing our discussant, Ambassador Piper Campbell, who is a professional professorial lecturer at the School of International Service, where she teaches classes on the Indo-Pacific. She was previously the head of the US mission to the Association of Southeast Asian Nations and ambassador to Mongolia. Uh, she served in the uh, State Department for 30 years uh, and retired with the rank of Minister Counselor. Uh, ambassador Campbell, please. And we are so lucky today to be joined by Peter Martin, a journalist at Bloomberg who bills himself as a defense policy and intelligence reporter, but also is an expert on China, which, and I asked Peter just before we started how he developed the Mandarin skills in order to read the in-depth articles that he did for his book, uh, which we're gonna be discussing today, China's Civilian Army. And I was interested to learn that his experience on the ground in China began when he was in, doing his graduate studies there in Beijing. And so having focused on not only understanding China, but also understanding Mandarin in order to understand the government, he comes to us today with that wonderful background um, and is, we're gonna have a great discussion about his book, China's Civilian Army. So Peter, I'm going to ask you to uh, kick us off with a bit of a description of the book. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, I I thought maybe I maybe I'd speak for sort of twenty minutes or so, and then we go into Q and A if that works with everyone. Um, so, um, yeah, I you know maybe it's worth starting out by you know explaining why I came to write a book about a topic so seemingly arcane as, as Chinese diplomats. And um, I guess the, the starting point for me was really, um, you know, coming back to China after a few years away in, in early 2017. Um, and the country had clearly made such incredible um, military and, and economic progress. Um, it was rolling out the Belt and Road Infrastructure Initiative, the, the um, you know, the Chinese economy was beating estimates. Um, the, the Chinese military was was building its first overseas military base in in Djibouti, um, but but and, and and perhaps most importantly of all, the Trump administration uh, was busy picking fights with U.S. allies and criticizing multilateral organizations. And so there seemed to be this big void that China could kind of step up and and take advantage of. And yet and yet somehow. As I was kind of watching this unfold as a as a reporter in Beijing, it became clearer and clearer that that for whatever reason, despite all of those um, kind of soft power advantages that that Beijing has, there's, a, there's hard power advantages that Beijing has, that the, the kind of ability to persuade and actually make its case and win hearts and minds was was an area where they really struggled. Um, and you know, as you think about the kind of world that we're heading into, where there are going to be multiple competing centers of power, um, it, there's going to be a real premium and a real advantage to, to countries which are able to master that art of persuasion. Um, and so I, I kind of came to see Chinese diplomats as, um, as a microcosm of, of, of China's kind of broader struggle to communicate. And, and it struck me that this is a group of people who um, very much need to be fluent in two very different worlds at the same time. There's the kind of closed and paranoid world of, of Chinese politics. And then um, there's the kind of more rarefied world of international diplomacy. Um, <clears throat> and they need to be able to interact in both equal um, effectiveness. And, and you can kind of see it on a personal level. You know, when you talk to individual Chinese diplomats, they come across as suave, funny, sophisticated, well-read. And then when they get up on stage in the foreign ministry or they sit down across the table from their US counterparts, as, as I'm sure you know, Ambassador, um, they can come across as kind of stilted, ideological, rigid, and you know, in recent years, um, increasingly aggressive even. Um, and so I started to look into kind of the roots of this behavior and came across this collection of about 
100 memoirs by former uh, Chinese diplomats, which explained, you know, what it was like to be on the front lines of Chinese diplomacy and make, um, make their case to the world and decided to use that as a way to, to pull together a book. And, you know, it started off as a pretty geeky and, and, and niche idea, but during the process of writing it, Chinese diplomats began storming out of international meetings, telling foreign counterparts to shut up, spreading conspiracy theories about the origins of COVID-19. And, and, and this, this phrase, wolf warrior diplomacy, really became kind of a hot topic. And um, you know, the, 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 it, it, it became a larger topic than I expected. <laughs> found myself wondering if you'd uh, had engineered that, if you'd paid Chinese diplomats to become interesting <laughs> sort of sexy in a weird sort of way, um, just in order to be able to bring a, a greater highlight to them because they have indeed taken a much higher profile than they had in the past. I didn't mean to interrupt you. But... No, no, not at all. Um, so, you know, as I, as I started um, to kind of wade through these memoirs and 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 try to um get a sense of, of of what was going on i realized that actually there had been displays of what we would now describe as wolf warrior diplomacy um right from the outset um and you know in, in fact uh i think that you know the, the reasons behind um some of this behavior really have their their roots in the chinese political system and the, and, the, and the the way that that sets up incentives for, for, for Chinese diplomats. Um, so when the PRC was founded in, in 1949, the country basically had no diplomats to speak of. Um, it kicked out all of the previous nationalist diplomats um, who had stayed on because it believed that they were too ideologically impure to represent the communist government. And, you know, they faced kind of a paradoxical challenge. This was a a highly paranoid political regime, which is obsessed with secrecy and worried about how the outside world might undermine its grip on power. And yet it needed to communicate with the world and, and win friends and, and build influence. And so they came up with this idea that, um, you know, that, that, that Chinese diplomats would model their behavior on the People's Liberation Army in, in civilian clothing. They would, they would model the fighting force which propelled the communists to power. And, and that meant that they would be unfailingly loyal to the Communist Party. They would be disciplined to a fault and they'd display um, a, a fighting spirit um, whenever China's interests were, were challenged. And, and, and so that led to kind of behaviors which we would now call wolf warrior diplomacy right from the outset. You said um, in the book that one of the things that you realized as you were reading these memoirs was that there's sort of Chinese diplomats don't get any passes, that there's, there's no negotiation, there's no action that they take as diplomats, which is, which is trivial, that every, every discussion is consequential. And as you think about the describing, if you think about the framing you were just describing, that starts to make a lot more sense. And as I thought back to my own engagement with Chinese diplomats, I found myself wishing I had understood that earlier. What are, could you give us some examples of how you saw that playing out within the memoirs um, where things that somebody might've thought, oh, you know, um, Beijing will understand that this occurrence, this is not something that I could have controlled, but from a Chinese diplomat, that's not what the thought that's going through their brain. Yeah, I mean, so that they actually kind of, uh, institutionalized that that mindset early on. Um, Joe and Lai, who was uh, the PRC's first uh, foreign minister, came up with this phrase where he said, "Why um, uh, sure there is no such thing as a trivial matter in diplomacy." Um, and so that that kind of creates this mindset where every interaction is, uh, you know, is a situation where China needs to win, at least in, in the sense that like um, its objectives need to be met. And if, if they're not met, um, you know, individual diplomats are gonna worry that they'll be held up for failure. And, and, and that, that kind of focus on attention to detail is, is also paired with a um, political system which, which constantly evaluates whether it's 
uh, you know, the country's diplomats are sufficiently loyal to the motherland and loyal to the political system. And even Zhou Enlai, um, you know, I remember reading some of the memoirs. He was he was offered an honorary degree in Poland, and he wrote kind of an emergency cable back to Beijing seeking Mao Zedong's approval to receive this honorary degree. And a, a junior diplomat said, why, you know, why would you seek the you know, head of state's approval for something so trivial. And he said, this is a matter of, you know, of, of, of politics. I must seek the chairman's permission. And so even from that top level all the way down, there's this focus on like uh, winning every small interaction. And then the knowledge that if you don't, the, the consequences aren't, aren't just kind of uh, professional failure, but perhaps also a judgment of political disloyalty. Yeah, and I'm glad to see we, we're actually starting to acquire questions in the queue. So anybody who's got questions, please go ahead and start to post them. But while we're waiting for more questions to um, pile in, you, you just spoke about this awareness of navigating a political space. Um, but in the book, you make the point, it's not only being conscious of the reactions within the party, it's also uh, being conscious of the reactions of the Chinese people and having the sense of the nationalism of the Chinese people and a concern that they are going to be judging your actions overseas. And I wondered how, if you would speak a bit more about how, what you saw of how the Chinese people regard their diplomats. And um, as a background to sort of how I'm thinking about that, um, from my own observations, I. So I always thought that the Chinese system, especially um, going back to the imperial period where you had the, the imperial civilian exams, examination process, and the idea that essentially the best and brightest would take the exams and enter government service, that within the Chinese system, there has been, let's say, greater respect for government bureaucrats than you might say, see in, in the American system. And so you have a, a strategic culture which values government service. You have the diplomats, the barbarian managers, um, who in many cases are seen as a, perhaps an elite, even among the elite of, of government officials. Um, but how does that play against this fear or sense that they are accountable to the people? I think I mean, it's a great question, and I, I think it's been it's been pretty complicated um, over time. You know, uh, as, as you said, there is this kind of basic respect for for government jobs, um, which which traces its roots back to imperial times. But also, um, you know, I think during during China's period of economic opening and the the, the kind of wind down of of, of communist policies there. Um, there was there was also kind of uh, a premium on jobs which could command a decent salary and uh, were stable at a time of economic um, uncertainty for a long time. And so there's there is some kind of um, legacy of that. But you know there's there's also been this continuous suspicion of Chinese diplomats um, on the part of the, the the government apparatus, but also to some extent the the public, you know, during the communist period, these were people who, when Chinese people didn't have much to eat and were living in, you know, at, at some periods in, in eating from communes and, you know, uh, parading in the streets, shouting Marxist slogans, these, these diplomats were in some cases whining and dining with, with foreign governments. And that created a great atmosphere of suspicion, which kind of exploded in the Cultural Revolution. And, the, the suspicion now and in the last few decades has focused less on kind of Marxist ideology and more on nationalism. You know, the, these people are, are talking to foreigners, they're making compromises with them. Um, and, you know, yeah, China is a great power, should be recognized as such, has territorial claims which, <clears throat> uh, on which, you know, we, we that the Chinese people don't don't believe there should be a great deal of compromise, especially on areas like Taiwan. And so there was this this kind of long-standing concern that maybe Chinese diplomats were going to sell out the country, and that's something that certainly bubbled up into online nationalism. And for, and for a long time, 
that kind of um, online opinion was a little bit separate from, from the way that the, the, the Chinese government and the, the top leaders evaluated the country because they wanted to improve China's image and win friends. And so they, despite the online nationalist demands, they kind of left a bit of space for Chinese diplomats to be diplomatic. Uh, but, you know, on, under Xi Jinping, I think he really has kind of embraced that popular nationalism and made it part of his government's platform. And as a result, uh, the Chinese diplomats don't have much cover. Uh, the, the safest thing for them to do is to embrace that nationalism too. And we've, we've certainly seen that in recent years. You mentioned um, this period of relative poverty in, in China and how that played out and how many the people would look at the diplomats and see them seeming to live a, a different life, lifestyle. I heard a story and I don't know if it's apocryphal or accurate, but of the Chinese diplomats who were traveling to New York in 1970, 1971, at the time when they were going to take their, the Chinese seat at the United Nations, essentially having to go around and collect dollars from party members because the Chinese government had so little um, American currency and essentially even not to the point of having enough funds for taking a cab from the airport and um, paying for the hotel in New York. And so I wonder if, if you've got any insight into this period of time when there may have been a difference between how people in China were perceiving a diplomatic lifestyle versus the actuality of what the diplomats on the ground faced. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I haven't heard that story, but I, I have to say I do believe it. Um, they were, they were really, that, the, the group um, who went out to the United Nations in 1971 were um, really dealing with, um, you know, a, a world which they hadn't encountered before. And, you know, for, actually forget about New York City diplomats from China who went out in the early, 1970s, I remember hearing, uh, reading accounts of uh, Chinese diplomats who saw air conditioning units for the very first time when they traveled to Africa. Um, they saw uh, Chinese diplomats who went to Venezuela saw uh, buildings taller than they had ever seen before. Um, so this, this was really, uh, I remember there was, there was another one who saw a, a commercially operated parking lot for the first time and thought it was interesting enough that they would write it in their memoir as a, you know, as a, a thing that had kind of shocked them at the time. And so this really was um, an incredibly eye-opening experience. And it's also, you know, it, it was kind of a scary experience for them. These are, these are people who had spent their entire adult careers being told that um, the outside world was scary and threatening and talking to foreigners will get you in trouble and people on the outside in the capitalist world that, that you know, are seeking to undermine our government and undo our national progress. Um, and so they, they had to kind of uh, navigate this, um, you know, this kind of strange and alien world while also being extremely cautious about what you know any small misstep might mean for them or for their their country and you know eventually they kind of learned to relax a little bit um and and and, and got into a rhythm of things but it took a long long time and i think it was very exciting for them but it was also scary um and and you know they they had access to information which was extremely scarce in China at the time. I, I remember reading about um, cables coming back from the United Nations to Beijing and, and people them being kind of shared across government ministries and people just being really hungry for any information about what life was like on the outside. And it's an extraordinary situation when you think about the, the you know, the, 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 the number of, uh, you know, global citizens who live in China and uh, the importance of the country that it should have been so stark, but but those early years really were quite uh, quite stark in that regard. I remember being a participant in a um, donor conference after two, the two thousand four Asian tsunami, and countries were making pledges. And I remember when the Japanese, or excuse me, when the Chinese delegation spoke up, and they made a what 
to everybody else in the room seemed a really minor pledge, a really piffling pledge. When others were pledging millions, they were pledging thousands. And in their remarks, they actually defended the pledge, making the point that China was a developing country. And it, it still that I still remember that moment because it felt to me like one of the best examples of this difference between essentially sort of global ambitions. And you speak a lot in the book about the century of humiliation, the whole idea of, of the national revival. So global amb ambitions, and yet at the same time, restricted means. I wonder if you have any thoughts or comments on that. And then we're gonna go to the, the question questions. Yeah, it's, it's something that, you know, the country continues to, um, to struggle with, I think. And, you know, it, it, it still, for example, at the World Trade Organization identifies itself as a, as a developing nation, which is something which, you know, irks quite a lot of people because it's the second largest economy in the world. And it has these industrial policies, which are uh, now considered by many people to be, um, you know, a, a threat to US national security interests in, in, in many ways. Um, and yet it's still true that there are hundreds of people, hundreds of millions of people in, in, in China who live in poverty and it, it, it is to, to many, to, to, you know, to a very large extent a developing country. And that, that does create um, kind of public opinion limitations, I think, um, on, on what the Chinese government can do in a way that, that we tend to forget when we sit in foreign capitals and look at maps of China's Belt and Road and it's listen to statements about its global ambitions and you know uh, press speculation about where its next overseas military base is going to be. Many Chinese people, uh, and I've had conversations with people about this, you know, read about the Belt and Road Initiative in China pledging all this money to um, you know, to foreign countries and, and, and that they're aware that they have relatives they have back in their hometowns who perhaps don't have quite enough to eat or, you know, whose who's, who's primary school is in bad shape or, uh, you know, or whatever. And, and, and so that that kind of creates resentment. And um, it's 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 something that is very easy to forget when you, you're sitting in, in, in Washington or somewhere else and reading about this stuff. Yeah. And we see that actually play out in the United States as well, where people regularly, American citizens, when asked what percent of the budget is de devoted to diplomacy and development, you know, regularly um, guess in, in, in decimals wrong, increments wrong, um, thinking that much more is spent um, against those objectives than actually is. And I wouldn't be surprised if it were the same on the Chinese side. One of um, our viewers asked, about how you got, um, how you established the re relationships and how you got access to the materials that you used. And I know you've lived in China for, um, in multiple stints in quite a period of time, but can you speak more to how this came about? Yeah, um, so I mean, the, the materials that, that I used were uh, published um, and, and, and publicly available. Um, so uh, they were put out mainly by uh, the, the, so the foreign ministry has its own um, publishing house. Lots of them were published by, by that, the World Knowledge Press. Um, lots of them were published by, um, you know, China's um, publishing industry is state owned. Um, lots of them were published by uh, local um, or provincial um, government presses. So. The Anhui People's Press, or the you know the Sichuan People's Press, and that and that that kind of thing, um, they weren't um, titles which I think ever would have sold very many copies inside of China, and and you, you wouldn't find them if you went into a bookstore in Beijing. But I I used Baidu, the Chinese search engine, which I found for this purpose. It's generally much worse than Google, but for this purpose, it was it was better, um, and just just put in uh, dozens, hundreds of different keyword searches, you know, Chinese diplomat memoir, Chinese diplomat recollections, Chinese ambassador recalls, you know, and just every keyword combination I could, um, and, and eventually kind of built up a, a long list of these books and one by one um, tracked them down on, um, 
uh, secondhand bookstores. There's a the secondhand um, book website called uh, Confucius Net, I think it's called, um, where uh, where you can get them, and they're they're super cheap. Um, so that and 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 it's actually something that I think people don't uh, don't realize about studying Chinese politics. Uh, just the, the sheer amount of published material which is actually out there to mine and it's all you know it all goes through a censorship process and um it's but 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 if you're if you're patient with it you can actually get really really interesting information and that was especially true of stuff that was printed in the 90s and the 2000s when the political climate was a bit more open in china um, but it's even true now, you know, you can you can learn a great deal just from reading, for example, Xi Jinping's speeches um, about how he sees the world. Um, you just have to be willing to wade through a lot of kind of turgid <clears throat> Marxies at the same time um, to get there. And so, so that's the kind of published sources side of things. Um, in terms of talking to Chinese officials um, and, you know, professors and think tankers, I think, um, you know, kind of th th that really is uh, slow and laborious work. And um, I think it's, it's a matter of, you know, it's not, it's a matter of being trustworthy. And if something, if you say something is off the record, it's off the record and you're never going to abuse that trust. And, and that's, you know, you have to do that in Washington too, but the stakes for someone in Washington versus in Beijing are, are very different and the, the amount of trouble they'll get in if you if you break that trust is, is very, very different. So being trustworthy, um, being um, kind of, and, and this gets harder and harder to do when, when you're asking about topics which can become quite emotive, like Xinjiang, for example, but asking questions which are open-ended and allow, um, Chinese interlocutors um, the opportunity to, to voice their own perspective. Um, so if you if you start up a conversation saying why is China being so aggressive in the East China Sea, that conversation is going nowhere. The person is going to get really defensive, and uh, you know for 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 reasons partly of patriotism but also partly of self preservation, they're going to tell you you know they're going to set you straight on that issue. But if you if you ask them, you know, like I don't think the world really gets why China is doing this, and to be honest, I don't really get it. Can you explain it to me? You're you're going to get some useful information. Um, so, sorry, that was kind of a long winded answer, but that's that's how I'd approach the the, the kind of human sources side of things. Yeah, great. And actually, we have a question specifically about Xinjiang, and uh, I thought it was a really interestingly phrased framed question. So thinking about it from the point of view of Chinese diplomats and their need to explain what's going on in Xinjiang and the government policies with regard to the Uyghurs, do, does, do Chinese diplomats, would Chinese diplomats evaluate the diplomatic approach as being successful? Um, so are they, are they in fact, considering the, the, let's say the campaign, the diplomatic handling of the situation um, successful or are, are they seeing this as a uphill battle to convince the world of the Chinese perspective on this issue? I think it's a really fascinating question. Um, a, a, a few things come to mind. They have had some real um, sort of substantive successes. Um, the biggest of which are these kind of letters that they have organised and statements that they've organised from uh, governments in Muslim majority countries, uh, which which kind of say, you know, we don't believe there is a genocide in in, in Xinjiang and, and and that kind of stuff. And that is a recognition of you know China's growing diplomatic clout. And the, the relationships that it's built with those governments, and and and, and frankly, also the, the 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 importance that they attach to economic cooperation with China, um, China's ability to do that is really quite um, striking. M my impression is that that probably doesn't filter down and onto the popular level with those in in those countries, but but many of them are not 
uh, you know, electoral democracies. And so perhaps that's not that's not front of mind for, for those governments anyway. So I think from, from, from their perspective, at least, that is a win. I think in kind of the, the court of global public opinion, they've had much less success. And, uh, and also, of course, with, um, with Western um, governments. And it's when you, when you think of um, the ask that they have in front of them, like, I, it just it strikes me as actually quite a, a, a nice way to get your head into the space of sort of wolf warrior type behavior. If, if you are confronted by a questioner who had tangible proof of what they said was genocide in a part of your country, and you had to come up and, and, and try to persuade, say, a US member of Congress that uh, you know using re-education camps was okay. I don't, I mean, what, how could you possibly phrase that in a way that was gonna be persuasive? I don't think there's any combination of words that would get that message across in a way that made sense. And so probably the safest thing for you to do would be to get quite angry and say, you hate China, you know, you're, this is a conspiracy against China and kind of act in a wolf warrior type way. And, um, and I think oftentimes on the Xinjiang issue, that's what they've done. They haven't really tried to engage or persuade. They've just kind of shouted. And, and actually, that makes a lot of sense. I don't really see how they could be persuasive on that point to most foreign audiences. Yeah, and I guess the other part of that is the safest thing to do is to use the talking points you're provided. And they might not be persuasive, but you can report back that you've gone in and delivered the message you were instructed to deliver. The um, another question we've got, and it ties right in with what you were just um, suggesting. So what you were suggesting strikes me as being empathetic to a Chinese diplomat's difficult position, you know, understanding how challenging it is on a personal level for that individual to succeed in the task that they've been given by their own government. But thinking more broadly about that, what advice would you have for American diplomats? as they seek to both, I think, develop relationships, um, but also um, have effective interactions with Chinese diplomats? Um, I would say, uh, don't take the posturing personally. Um, and, uh, you know, I know this is, this is difficult now that, um, so many interactions are, are, are virtual and not in person but you know i've heard lots of stories from from foreign diplomats go into the foreign ministry in beijing and literally be shouted at you know seething red in the face chinese diplomats would shout at them and then and then they would walk them after the meeting had concluded the chinese diplomats would walk them down to the parking lot and pat them on the back and say how good it was to see them and remember that um you know they have they have their own incentives for behaving that way in in meetings and um you're really talking to the institution more than you're talking to the person in those cases and and you're so so don't take it too personally you can still try to cultivate some kind of personal relationship and, and take those little moments of um you know relaxed chit chat seriously if you can and try to build them into something um over time um so I guess I guess that would be my my main piece of advice for individual Chinese for individual kind of U.S. diplomats um, seeking to deal with the, the the Chinese side. I mean, I guess there's also kind of a um, uh, I don't know what you would call it, like a sort of a, 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 almost like a protocol um, tip as well. And I think that the the U.S. side is is quite interesting. It has kind of evolved in the way that it approaches. Um, Chinese diplomats since the Anchorage meeting in what was that in March of 2021 um, when the, the format at the start of the meeting you know allowed China's top diplomat Yang Jiechi to, to launch into this extraordinary 17-minute uh, diatribe um, directed at, at Secretary of State Antony Blinken. I think since then the meetings that have taken place just haven't had that kind of open to cameras spray at the 
the outset and they've kind of removed the platform that Chinese diplomats have there. And so there is kind of that like just practical tip as well that, you know, for, 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 for a variety of reasons, they're incentivized to behave this way at the moment. So don't give them the platform. And that actually, that event, the Anchorage event was really unusual because it, it really, it ushered in, I would say a new chapter because in the past, when you had meetings like that, the opening spray, the first 10 minutes, yes, there'd be a lecturing and that kind of goes back. I think even I recall some of the memoirs I've read about Nixon's visits to China, Kissinger's advanced visits and how there you would sit and be lectured, but you'd be lectured based on, again, sort of the, you talked about the turgid prose, um, the political lines that were usually pretty predictable. And then mm. the cameras would go away and you'd get down to business. Um, this idea of performing for the cameras is really is something that's quite new. Um, you mm. missed the chance to give diplomats another piece of advice, which is to read your book. Because I, <laughs> yeah, I guess so. <laughs> may, I, may I cut in with a question? Yeah, absolutely. So Peter, as I was listening to you talk, it seemed to me that there are sort of three explanations for the wolf warrior phenomenon, and you can correct me if I'm wrong. One mm -hmm. is, is that there's something pathological about the Chinese system whereby people feel they need to be tough so that it doesn't uh, hurt their careers or they're sort of entrepreneurs and they're seeing which way the wind is blowing and the louder and the meaner they are, the more likely it is that they'll be promoted to the um, spokesperson for the, for the Chinese foreign ministry. So that's like an institutional pathological um, uh, story. Uh, another story is that as China is rising, these emotional blinders are increasingly prominent. This idea that uh, it's also a pathological story, right? Because it's it's leading to a reaction that is a, that is meeting emotional needs at home, whether the leaders uh, or people uh, within China. So those are both pathological. Something's wrong with the institution or or the processing stories. But then there's a third element that does come through at least a little bit which is the practical side to wolf warrior diplomacy in the sense that if you are a Chinese leader, perhaps you could tell yourself a story that if there is no, for, no room for negotiation and that the other side really is out just to get you, that it makes sense to be um, obnoxious and arrogant and loud uh, because it shows that there are costs uh, to that broad approach uh, to China. Uh, and I'm curious if you could uh, say which one of those three uh, you think uh, is is the most uh, prominent and whether you think that it's uh, changed over time. And then also this ties into a second question is, is, uh, that goes back also to what uh, Ambassador Campbell just asked you, which is, you know, one of the biggest debates that we keep seeing over and over again is about uh, whether Xi Jinping is a new kind of leader and what we're seeing from China is new and whether he is rejecting Deng's alleged policy of, of biding the time. But, you know, as you've been talking about, you know, during the Mao eras, and I think maybe at least to a certain extent during the Deng eras too, you could certainly get shrill uh, responses um, from Chinese diplomats. So would you say that there is, you know, a qualitative difference um, from Xi Jinping or return to a theme? What kind of words would you use to characterize uh, either continuity or difference in terms of wolf diplomacy with the Xi Jinping era in the past? Yeah, great questions. I mean, I think in terms of those three explanations, I, I, I do think that all three are important. Um, they, uh, you know, the, 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 I'll kind of take them in, in backwards order. The, 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 the practical one, they've got cases in the past where they use these kind of shrill tactics and were successful. So, um, when David Cameron and Nick Clegg, I think it was in 2010, but I may have that date wrong, met with the Dalai Lama, they froze uh, diplomatic ties with Britain for a year and Britain backed down and the Cameron government then tried to initiate this um, golden age in its relations with China. And we all know how, we all know how that ended, but in that, in that short term case, they, they were successful. With um, South Korea, Although they they alienated a lot of people in the country when they they had this incredibly shrill response to them hosting the the FAD anti missile system, I think China might also um, 
uh, argue that it had pushed back South Korean elites um, in that case. Uh, Norway, after uh, Liu Xiaobo was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in I think 2011, there was a similar process that took place. And they're, they're, they're trying the same with Australia now. And, and they're also trying the same thing with, with Lithuania. And, and there were a few sort of tentative signs that it might even have been successful in that case, although I think we, we don't know how that story ends yet. So, so they, they kind of do have some success cases to point to there. I guess the that I, I would tend to see those um, those cases, though, as, as instances of tactical success and strategic failure. They succeed in badgering elites and making them pull back um, from whatever actions uh, they were they were committing that upset China. But in the process, they damage their country's reputation and they increase the likelihood that that other nations will uh, join with the U.S. in creating a countervailing coalition to Beijing's power. So it's a I don't really see how they're going to be. So that's the third point. The, third point. the second point on emotional blinders um, is also really great. It's a slight echo in this sound. But, um, on, on, on kind of a, a emotional blinders, um, I, 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 I do think it's important beneath the surface. And, you know, Chinese diplomats now have a very different set of life experiences to, to Chinese diplomats who, you know, were leaving the foreign ministry 10 years ago. Um, you know, they have, they have people who are kind of mid-level now who have only known China as a, a country that's grown richer and more powerful and is increasingly respected. And I'm sure that that does bleed through into their behavior. But, but I do think that in the past when emotions have run high and the leadership has signaled that it wanted to take a different lower low key tack, they've, they've been able to kind of um, shut that stuff down. And I think that the same would be the, the case now if Xi Jinping were to illustrate that he wanted to go in a different direction, which kind of brings me to that, that institutional um, explanation, which you identified as really important. And I, I don't think of it so much as the, the Chinese foreign ministry being inherently set up um, to push it towards wolf warrior type behavior. I think that the foreign ministry is set up to be an exceptionally politically disciplined organization, which, you know, is modeled on the, the you know, the People's Liberation Army and whatever, and, and um, is extremely responsive to the will of the leadership in Beijing. So when the leadership in Beijing decides that it, you know, in the 50s, that it wants to charm the developing world, Chinese diplomats do that with incredible success. When they decide in the 90s that they want to rehabilitate the country's image in the aftermath of Tiananmen, they do they do that with incredible success. But when it, you know, when things become tense in Beijing, or there's a focus on the cult of personality of one leader or political ideology, um, the foreign ministry kind of veers in that direction and starts behaving in this wolf warrior type way. Um, in a way that I think just simply wouldn't happen um, in other political systems. If you, if you think about the tone set by the Trump administration, um, and to some extent by Secretary of State Mike Pompeo, and then the response of US career foreign service officers, they didn't start acting like Donald Trump on stage. They, they maintained a degree of professionalism that you would expect of people who well, loyalty to the US constitution and to be bipartisan. But Chinese diplomats don't have that same kind of like professional check on their behavior. If leadership says move in this direction, they move quickly in that direction. And under so Xi, would you, meant assertive nationalism. Could it be said that, could it be said that you're Sorry, identifying- that was a long answer. But. No, I'd love to follow up if that's okay. It sounds to me that you're identifying a fourth factor, which is arguably also a pathological factor, which is, the focus on one leader and the focus on ideological discipline, which are domestic political stories, essentially, are having spin-offs uh, into the foreign ministry that arguably are not beneficial for China's ability to conduct effective foreign policy. Would that be like a, maybe another fourth, arguably pathological factor, this, this changes at home about the leader and about the role of, of how they talk about ideology? Is, is another element to contributing to this phenomenon? Yeah, I mean, so I, I, I think that that is, I mean, I don't know if I would spin it up as a fourth individual factor or not, but that, 
that those kind of institutional incentives I really see as key to the way that we evaluate how Chinese diplomats are acting at, at a particular time. Yeah. And I think it's important when we use the term dip, Chinese diplomats or American diplomats to note that we're primarily really talking about ambassadors because the ambassadors are primarily the external face. And so to the extent that we're able to, that we're talking about behaviors that we're observing, it would be primarily ambassadors overseas and then the senior um, officials within the ministry at home. Um, I found myself, as you were describing Chinese behavior um, earlier, this is a slightly diploma, undiplomatic, but I found myself thinking that those experiences of you know, the um, bombastic meeting followed by the pleasant aside, for me, uh, having served sort of much of my, tour, experience, my career in Asia, that experience was much more with the Russians and much less with, with China, my Chinese interlocutors, I would have to say. But it certainly is, it's always jarring when you have the official part of the meeting and the un, unofficial part feels so different than what's going on in, in the official. Um, I wanted, as, as we were talking about sort of this question of the structure of the foreign ministry, the career of being a diplomat, one of the things that, that has struck me again and again in interacting with Chinese diplomats is the extent to which it's a family affair. Um, and I have met so many very senior Chinese diplomats whose spouses also were in the, the Chinese Foreign Service, which in many times posted in different places, but you very much had the sense of this being really a commitment, a way of life, and a commitment of the entire family. I recently spoke to an American individual, an author named Philip Nash, who wrote a book called Breaking Protocol, where he was looking at America's first female ambassadors. And I wondered um, what, if anything, emerged as you were doing the research and thinking about this story, um, this book. Oh, what emerged as you look at gender differences, um, any great stories of female Chinese ambassadors rising to that rank. Any difference that you see? I know there's some well-known female wolf warriors, but anything that you see on, on the gender side that might be interesting to share with our audience? Yeah, it's it's a theme that I, I tried to tease out as, as much as I could. Um, although on, on some of the topics where, um, you know, institutional sexism or, um, workplace harassment and, and, and those kind of things where I had I had hoped that there might be something perhaps naively there just really wasn't there was nothing in the memoirs and even when you speak to Chinese diplomats about it it's quite hard to get them to to say anything on that front and so the, the, the Chinese government institutionally like lots of big organizations around the world but Perhaps it's even worse because uh, the Chinese government is so secretive. Of course, there is a, 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 a big um, uh, culture of sexism and um, uh, you know conditions for for women who are seeking to rise to the top of the organisation would be pretty tough. It's just hard to tease out specifics. Um, so I did I did find that quite difficult. Something that Mao Zedong um, toward the end of his life was was frustrated by was the fact that there had been no Chinese, um, there'd been no female ambassador. Um, and so he he kind of pushed for that. And he, he uh, there were a series of comments in the sort of early to mid seventies where he said that he expected progress to be made on, on that front. Um, and I think, I think that China's first female ambassador was posted to the Netherlands, if, I, if I'm remembering that correctly. And, and so that, you know, things did kind of start to pick up in the 1980s and you would you would know far more about this than me in the US context but my impression of what it's worth in the US is that oftentimes some of the greatest successes with the US Foreign Service have been kind of that the, the numbers improve but female ambassadors are often posted to places that aren't necessarily the most strategic you know targets I, I hear lots of stories about people complaining of their sent to small island nations and, and whatever. And, and I think that, you know, China, China kind of has the same um, issue 
Uh, yeah, so it's, it's not something yeah. that I was able to tease out in huge detail, but it's kind of there beneath the surface. The first um, U female US ambassador was appointed in 1933, and she was actually appointed to Denmark. Hmm. Um, yeah, th there is a, it's something that, that we continue to look at. It's not only the number on the US side, not only the number of female ambassadors, but the, the posts to which they're assigned. Peter, I don't want to let you go. I don't want to let this session end without asking you to do some predictions. Um, and I noticed as I, I was looking before we came online at some of your most recent pieces, many of which unsurprisingly are focused on Ukraine. And so I want to ask you, what do you think the Chinese government is watching in the Ukraine situation? And how how would they read the tea leaves? What yeah, how would they think about different approaches, uh, depending on what what we see happen next in Ukraine? I've been thinking about this a lot recently as well. I haven't I haven't written anything on on China's response yet, although I've been it's kind of been percolating a little bit in my in my head. I think there are kind of a few levels for 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 China as it looks at this. Um, there is the immediate practical concern of the success of the Winter Olympics, and it's been widely commented upon that, um, that Beijing likely wouldn't want its event to be upstaged with an invasion. That that didn't stop Putin in, in 2008 with Georgia, but, um, but you know, I'm, I'm sure that, that that is a real um, consideration of theirs. Um, I think there is a kind of, uh, I don't know quite how to phrase it, partly rhetorical, but also partly sincere, partly sincere commitment to um, national sovereignty in Beijing's foreign policy, which uh, even though they're very close partners with Russia, they do recognize Ukraine as an independent country. And I think would find it difficult to stomach a, a full on invasion and, um, part, you know, that, re that relates partly to their own ability to defend their own territorial interests, but, but I, I don't think that it's entirely hollow. I do think that there would be genuine concern there. And then I think there are a couple of other things that play in. I think that it's extremely favorable to Beijing when the US is distracted by other regions. Uh, you know, I was, I was on Secretary Blinken's trip um, to Ukraine, um, to, to Kiev, Berlin and, and Geneva recently and, and was kind of struck as, as we were traveling that, wow, look at the amount of top US government attention that's going to this and then compare that with the stated objectives of the administration to compete with Beijing more effectively and to focus on the Pacific. And so that, uh, you know, in the same way as the, the Iraq wars and the focus on, on the Middle East during the, the Bush and Obama administration certainly is something that Beijing's going to be thinking about. And they prefer to have Washington's focus elsewhere and, and not in Beijing's backyard. And then I think the final thing they're going to be looking at is this kind of question of US resolve. Um, and it's, you know, they, they, they will have come up with their own evaluations of the the Syria red line under Obama. They will have come up with evaluations on, you know, the, the 2014 encroachments into Ukraine and the US's ability to, or not, to deter those. Um, and, 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 and what that might mean for their own ability to say, scrap, um, you know, to, 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 move, to, to, to encroach on Hong Kong's autonomy and, and other things like that, build artificial islands in the South China Sea. Um, and they'll be they'll be watching the current. They they certainly I've spoken to Chinese officials about the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan, which they were watching in a in a similar way. Um, and I, I know that you know I've spoken to people at the State Department about this, and they find it really irritating when people say that the Afghan withdrawal was a signal that the U.S. wasn't you know lacked resolve or whatever. But unfortunately, the U.S. doesn't get to choose how the rest of the world views that withdrawal. And I think in Beijing, a lot of people saw it as a sign of of weakness um, and that they'll, they'll be watching very, very closely events in Ukraine now to try and decide what kind of leader is Biden? How much is he willing to put on the line to stop a territorial incursion? And, you know, really crucially, I think, 
uh, they'll be looking when it comes to the kind of gray zone tactics that, that Russia is so good at deploying and Beijing has also been good at deploying. You know, maybe Biden, maybe President Biden is able to, to stare down a, a, a full on invasion of Ukraine, but, but he's unable to hold the NATO alliance together when it comes to cyber attacks or special operations or those kind of things. And, and those are precisely the, the fronts on which Beijing might move in the Pacific. And so they'll, they'll be working on the too. That's, that's great. And that's really useful for our students to sort of hear that type of analysis and the, the way that you described your thinking on that is super. Um, as we close out, you describe, you've described diplomacy as the art of persuading um, another party that your that um, acceding to your position is in their interests. I think I got that right. Um, and I want so I want to ask you to give the give Chinese diplomats the scorecard, give them a grade. Is this wolf warrior diplomacy effectively persuading others to Chinese positions? And if so, how does that work? And if not, do you think they'll, they're going to adapt in order to find more effective ways to achieve their objectives? I, I think that they're incredibly effective at using carrots and sticks. Uh, so, you know, economic inducements with things like the promise of trade deals, uh, Belt and Road Initiative, where they're offering infrastructure financing. Um, and they're, they're pretty effective also at threatening to boycott trade with other countries or, or even threatening quasi sort of military measures with the maritime fishing militia and those kind of things. The, but that's, that's a, sort of, those are strengths for Beijing's diplomacy broadly defined and usually carried out by ministries that aren't the foreign ministry, not by professional diplomats. They're carried out by economic ministries or, or by the, the Chinese military. When it comes to Chinese diplomats themselves, uh, I, rem I remember interviewing former US ambassador, uh, Chaz Freeman about this. And he, he sort of talked about what he thought it was to be a successful diplomat. And he said, you know, everyone has to work with turgid talking points from their, their capital, but it's, it's whether you can sitting in the room across from a person, take those talking points and use your decades of accumulated knowledge about the history and the culture of the place that you're sitting, the personal history of the interlocutor, uh, the, the mood in the room and kind of the, the spirit of the moment and, and, and turn those talking points into something that makes your case and your, you know, Washington's line or your capital's line persuasive to the person in the room. And that's, that really is how he saw the art of diplomacy. And I think, on that much narrower front, Chinese diplomats are uh, really hamstrung by their political system. It's not, it's not a matter of, of a sort of personal shortcomings, but they're given such little latitude to kind of take those talking points and, and stretch them and finesse them in a way that's effective that I think that they really, really struggle. And so they end up um, you know, relying much more on, on, on inducements and threats than on the true art of sort of diplomatic persuasion. And to Joseph's point a little bit earlier, it's almost as if the incentive structure is not is now skewed against to sort of something that's not necessarily effective delivery, uh, effective persuasion in many cases. Well, Peter, exactly. thank you so much for giving us this time. I know um, uh, the students at American University really benefited from those perspectives, and I hope that others were listening in as well. Um, so, Joseph, do you have any final comments before we close out? No, just to say that this was wonderfully attended. I thought the uh, discussion and questions uh, were wonderful. So thank you to the both of you for making such a meaningful uh, event today. Thanks, Peter, thank you. Absolutely. So that was Peter Martin, author of um, China's Civilian Army. Thank you very much, Peter. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.